So we apologize. We got a little bit of a late start uh, in the previous segment uh, due to some technical issues. So we're a little bit behind, but we're going to let Jennifer uh, give a little background on herself. And for those of you who have come here tonight, um, I think you'll uh, gain a lot of insight, information, and wisdom since you got one of the more experienced people in this industry. And just want to mention, too, that 7 o'clock, the Indian Council General Gupta will be here uh, and speaking. So that will be starting at 7 this evening. So without further ado, Jennifer Warren. Thanks, Thanks for, for having me. I'm glad to be back. I'm, I'm here from six months ago. Yep. I'm, I'm now part of the act, I think. Um, but I have a, co a consultancy called Concept Elemental, and basically sort of what I'm here to talk about those, one of my claims to fame is that I've chronicled like all the shale booms, and I've studied energy markets, and I live in Dallas, Texas, where the booms began, but I also have a background in geopolitics. I ran um, Dallas Committee on Foreign Relations for several years, and I'm also in sort of like a an environmental space and a, and a business space. But I wasn't prepared to do my own intro, but, um, but you'll, you'll sort of see what I, what I do as, as we get going here. I don't want to waste time now since we, we're running short. I want to give you as much time as possible. Um, so my title, my talk is called Globalization's New Twist, an Energy Revolution and a Pandemic Reset the Stage. So in the United States, two shale booms happened, one in gas and then in oil. Technology, entrepreneurial grit, and necessity came together, and Texas was an epicenter. Infrastructure networks shape-shifted to refashion a large U.S. hydrocarbon system. Bold leaders made investments, took risks, and now we're an exporter, whereas we were not before. We now are offering the globe more, choice, more energy choices than it existed before. Um, next, globalization continu continues to march on while these shale booms are happening. Green ambitions morph into now a decarbonization drive. And then we have a pandemic, which resets the stage. Priorities are changed with countries, companies, and households. And now modernization and in innovation are pushing growth differently. And I have this case from the Texas Triangle, which is this region that I'll, I'll show you in a, in a moment. But it's Dallas to the north, Austin, San Antonio to the south, Houston over to the east. And it, and it forms a triangle. It's actually $2.5 trillion of GDP. And there's, it's a really high growth area. And it's sort of really kind of a model. And it shows a lot of economic strength in the United States. And things that I think can happen in the future. So actually, I, I have a lot of hope for the United States. And, and there's actually a lot of global business and activity that's really coming to the United States because of these reshifting priorities. And, and I will show you that in a minute. Um, but what I am going to show you about this in this Texas Triangle is this example of reindustrialization. I know we hear a lot about nearshoring, and in fact, it is, it is really happening. It's happening slowly, but I've, I've sort of started seeing it with my own eyes. And it also kind of reveals what the next decade is, decades of globalization could look like. Um, at the heart of this case also um, is environmental and corporate stewardship and kind of a real circular economy example. And so these are all real positive stories, I think, that are things that, you know, Gen Z's, Gen Y, and, and all of us are interested in. Um, and I'm going to convey this through my field work. Um, many see me as a journalist, but a lot of my work actually represents, you know, my own research and just sort of seeing trends and putting things together. So everything that I talk about, for the most part, I've seen firsthand or I've interviewed firsthand those that are involved in it. Um, so, in, in North Texas, this is where shale gas one happened. And shale gas became commercial in the early 2000s. I first started interviewing about it in like 2005 with a man named Scott Sheffield, who I'll talk about in a minute. But this is a story I wrote in 2008 um, in Dallas, DCEO magazine. Um, and, and the irony is, back then, when natural gas was really coming to the fore, we were discussing how it was a lower carbon energy source. Um, that was back in, you know, two, almost two decades ago. We're still debating this and still arguing this in some respects. 
And it turns out that something that's interesting is that you can, in fact, grow GDP and reduce carbon emissions. And a, a lot of the way that's happening, and it's happening in Texas and it's happening in the United States, is reducing coal and adding natural gas to the grids. Um, and, and we're kind of a case of that. So next what happens is that this is sort of reflecting shale gas too. And now we're sort of at the advent of global gas. And this happened largely because of the invasion by Russia of Ukraine. So after the first shale boom, um, it started fizzling in 2008 because of the financial crisis. I mean, it continued on, but it kind of it took a, a back seat. But shale gas and natural gas has come into the fore again because of you know, Russia doing what it did. And this chart, let me see if I can get the pointer here, what this chart represents. So this is a story over here that I wrote in the fall of 2022. And I was actually working on it all throughout like, the invasion. Um, this gentleman here, he, he's like one of the early shale gas pioneers. And in fact, you know, North Texas gets all the credit for the shale gas revolution, but he was actually working on it in the 80s in New Mexico, believe it or not. And he was in Europe also trying to help Europe develop their natural gas resources. And so he's been over there for two decades. And so in fact, the work he's doing is also going to help Europe in the future. But this, what, what this shows, and this data came from him and his firm. So back in 2003, the, the European Union and the UK were 60% self-sufficient in gas. And that went down to 20% self-sufficient. You know, in other words, they were importing largely from Russia. And then if you look here, this, this yellow line is their imports, their dependency on Russia. 2003, it was only 20%. It goes up to a third. And so the irony to me is this line here, 2014, where, where they cross, where Europe became more less self-sufficient, more dependent on Russia. This is the first Ukraine invasion. You know, so I find that really, really kind of an interesting, interesting development. Um, and the other thing, too, that I can say is, um, hang on, my notes. I always get carried away with this chart. It just always blows my mind. As I was saying, if there's one thing, one contribution, I think this, these numbers are sort of like economic um, poetry in motion. Um, so what this did, though, was it started the advent of global gas. We started exporting LNG in 2016. And had we not done all the work before that, we wouldn't have been able to really come to Europe's rescue, which we did. Um, and then next, shale oil happens. And this really got, this story was in, the, the first shale oil story, sort of my breakout story, was in 2013, 2014. And this is a story from 2021. And the reason that I, I highlight it now is because what it reflects is something called the Permian Basin, which is really where the shale oil boom um, took off in earnest. And the shale in, in the Permian, it's just this massive region of hydrocarbon development. And like there's a density of skills, infrastructure, and all the social networks to make this happen. And this man, in particular, Scott Sheff Sheffield, he, he, was, oops, he was called the, um, the Permian Basin King. He won this award in 2021. He was there to lead, and, and he was like a really vocal person in the Permian, including helping the Permian start reducing its methane emissions. So he, in fact, has been somebody trying to help the hydrocarbon industry become cleaner, pioneer, now they're being acquired by Exxon, but they were one of the first firms to pledge net zero. And now that Exxon is buying them, they're in fact going to move their timeline up. So this is kind of the story a little bit about the energy transition that's, that we commonly talk about is that the hydrocarbon industry is now really having to double down on reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. And, and they know that that's their social license to operate if they're going to be, you know, you know, not, not combating renewables, but having to play alongside renewables with the desire for lower carbon energy. The other thing I want to note is that we're an, now we're an oil exporter, which started in 2015. 
We're now exporting five million barrels a day from the Gulf Coast, um, Corpus Christi, and, and the Gulf Coast of Louisiana and Texas. Whereas before, in the early 2000s, we were importing four million barrels a day. And, and the thing that's really interesting to note is that were it not for the Permian and the U.S. oil and gas production, we would be largely reliant on OPEC, the very place that we just heard about how really lovely everything is there. <laughs> you know, so that's the really good news about our production, even though there's a lot of pushback, you know, the blowback that the hydrocarbon industry gets. The other thing I just want to mention is that there's this major consolidation going on now. Post-pandemic, um, there was 230, $234 billion of M&A activity in 2023, and that is because they're trying to become more efficient. And also, like I said, there's going to be more barrels now that are going to be under publicly traded firms, which means greater transparency. The oil market tends to be characterized by, you know, national oil companies from the Middle East, you know, Iran, Saudi Arabia, um, and so those are places that are very opaque markets and very politically, you know, oriented. And so I think it's a really good thing that, in fact, more oil and gas production in the, in the, on the globe will be more publicly traded, you know, offering higher standards, transparency, governance, all that. And this is just a, another feature I did in the fall, just this last fall. And basically with all the shale oil and gas production, all the infrastructure had to be worked because we were importing before and now we are becoming an exporter. And like I said, you know, bold entrepreneurs had to risk billions to make this happen. And now something that I learned um, at a conference at the F um, Oklahoma Fed last fall was that because of the United States now exporting LNG like, like we are to the extent that we are, we are now a global market supplier that offers liquidity, the ability to trade. You know, and it, so these are much freer barrels, if you will, than, than what previously existed. So that's, that's positive for the United States you know, being a, a hydrocarbon powerhouse so that we can kind of counterbalance some of the ill effects around the world. So there is a positive, positive to all this. Um, next, I just want to mention that in, other, in order to look at what is driving energy around the globe and in the United States, it's really, you have to look at the fundamentals. And the fundamentals are that the developing world is really driving like increased natural gas demand. There's growth until 2040, and that's largely from Asia. It doesn't matter how many net zero pledges there are by governments or what policies, this demand is f pretty fixed. Um, it, just, it just is. Um, there will be growth of renewables, absolutely, but with it, what's happening in, specifically in places like China, India, including Germany, they're having to fire, you know, use more coal generation um, as, as renewables grow. So you're kind of just washing those emissions, you know, it's not necessarily getting greener. In fact, we've gotten greener in our country because of natural gas. And I just want to note too, just for a number, so in, in around the globe, we consume about 103 million barrels a day. Um, there's a lot of different forecasts as to when oil markets peak. Uh, McKinsey, the consultancy firm, says by 2030 it would be 106 million barrels a day. That's really hard to say. There's a lot of different scenarios depending on how fast government policies get enacted. Um, so there's vi large variances like to the tune of 6 million barrels. Um, and in a net zero world to 2050, if we were to go to net zero, there would be like 25 mil million barrels a day, and the Permian wouldn't be needed, and it would largely be produced by OPEC. So we would have an OPEC world in that scenario. Um, and just to note, um, a lot of my learnings in all this happened because I had access to this top resource financial econo economist, and I was, and still am, um, the editor of a, a knowledge site at the um, Southern Methodist University Cox School of Business. And since 2003, I helped develop their knowledge site, and I profile academic research. And because um, of this one 
oil market expert. You know, I really, I really sort of cut my teeth and learned about resource economics, and, and so I, I'm very grateful to him. This is just showing you what the global gas market looks like. So these are all LNG terminals. The jewel tones, like the green and the blue, these are all import facilities, and as you can see, it's largely in Europe, a lot of Asia, South America, and then the warm tones are all export facilities. That's us. We're a big exporter. Australia is an exporter. Qatar is a big ex exporter. There's some Africa, but we're really, in the future, we're really going to be more of where new L LNG facilities are built because the economics favor us. We can build L LNG facilities more efficiently, plus we have lower cost natural gas and an abundance of it. So there is going to be a call on America. And again, I think that puts us in a good position when you consider you know, Russia, China, Middle East. Um, I, think, I think it's a really you know, fortuitous development that, that we have this resource. I'm very green, you know, I'm a total nature lover, and you'll see in a minute, and, but yet I understand geopolitics and, and economics and business, and so, um, you know, I'm very agnostic when I look at the resource world. And this has really come true over time, how I've evolved my viewpoint. Again, what I want to say here about the gas market, natural gas, in a climate change world, in a net zero world, in an emissions reduction world, you know, natural ga gas is a, is a good transition fuel. It's a needed fuel for power generation base load because renewables can't get you there all the way. And there's a lot of constraints to do with renewables. And there's decades of demand. So those are just the fundamentals of the gas market. You know, it's just, the, it's just what is. Um, and I know, you know, we want, want it to be di different. You know, we want this ideal, you know, energy world. But this is what the, this is kind of really what the world looks like. Now I'm switching gears a little bit. And I'm kind of pivoting to talk about some globalization work. Um, so these are stories I actually did in 2008. And 2008, believe it or not, um, is a high growth period with our um, imports with China because the financial crisis happened and it kind of it kind of reduced after that. Um, so it's kind of a high watermark period of globalization that was derailed by the financial crisis. Um, so what's interesting about this China's green future story, this was in Far Eastern Economic Review and it came out December 2008. What I'm, what I'm showing in this story, and, these are, and this is all online, all my work, you can Google any of it, it's there, it's all on my website. All my work's like totally transparent, publicly available. Um, China needed us. In 1978, we started our relationship with helping China develop their energy systems and help them with developing their economy. And in fact, I knew a wind energy developer that was over in China in the in the 90s, and this story represents him being over there and how we, in fact, were cooperating in energy for 25 years. You know, we helped China get to where it, it is, and then that all changed in 2013 when Xi Jinping took over. So it, it became very different. And the other thing I want to note, too, and this is the irony of this story, China's green future, that was in 2008, and that was actually tongue in cheek because what was the concern at the time was that we were the top um, carbon emitter at that time, and China was about to overtake us because of all the coal generation. And so China's green future is kind of like tongue in cheek, right? Well now, fast forward to, to today, 2023, they spent 676 billion of the $1.7 trillion of low carbon investment last year, which was 40% of total global low carb investment. We were like 300 billion, Europe's 240, and a lot of Europe has to do with, you know, government policies, you know, chipping in. So, and as we know with China, it's very much, you know, the Chinese government is, is driving that. And we know too that, you know, we've heard about a lot of the upset in Europe about EV exports, you know, because 
you know, it's supply side driven and, and that's their policy to export, but the rest of the world cannot take in all those exports and so you're seeing a lot of pushback in that as well. This is just to note, also I was doing some India work on Indian infrastructure, help, you know, they needed like 500 billion um, in, in funds to help with their economy and now they're like, their GDP growth rate is supposed to be 7% this year. Um, they need a lot of power infrastructure. Um, you know, they import a lot of ru oil from Russia. In fact, what um, Bob and Meredith were talking about with China, um, yeah, China has pivoted over to, to OPEC, you know, as, as their biggest um, consumer. You know, it's, China is OPEC's biggest customer, basically. But now what's happening, though, with um, Russia invading Ukraine and how things are changing. China, Russia is now China's biggest import of importer of oil, and India, they were in, they were Russia's top um, importer as well. But that's starting to change a little bit, and I don't I don't know their policy. But um, next, I want to shift over into now, where th this part about you know, changing globalizations. So I wrote this in the fall of 2022. And this was, you know, we were coming out of the pandemic. We had all these policies that we had implemented, the infrastructure bill, the chips bill, semi semiconductor chips bill, and the IRA legislation, which is the lo low carbon bill. So one thing the pandemic revealed, obviously, were all these vulnerabilities that we had, and a lot of it was this, you know, semiconductor and the chip chip industry. Um, but our priorities have started shifting. Um, there is nearshoring going on. It's just starting to emerge. The other thing that became a priority, and in Russia really laid this bare, is that energy security, affordability, and diversification are now priorities. Whereas before, there was really this more of this idea of you know, low carbon push. That's still there, but energy security affordability is trumping that. And we're really starting to see that more in Europe as well. They're, they're having to roll back some of their green, green ambitions just, just because of cost and security. Um, and you know, the transition that's commonly talked about, and especially because it's my industry, it's characterized as being cleaner but there are density challenges to do with renewables, plugging those renewables into the grid and all that. And then I just want to say a priority that's really apparent too, and you see this with the United States, with Europe, uh, China, India, that everybody wants a technologically advanced economy and those require a lot of energy. So you have to have more sophisticated systems. Just quickly, I want to, because I'm, from Texas, and I just want to show you what I mean about the, the exports. So this is from the Dallas Fed. I was at a conference of theirs not too long ago. And if you look at the, the red line, that's just exports in 2003. They're sort of flat. This is the United States minus Texas. And then there's the pandemic, you know, happened to everybody. And then exports are flat. Again, this is the United States exports minus Texas. Blue line is Texas. Here's where we start exporting, um, starts ramping up, pandemic, ramps up as we get going again. So as you can see, the energy story in the United States export story is a big energy story. Um, and we were in fact, 20% um, of global LNG volumes in 2022. And, and that really changed because of Russia. Um, we are, between Texas and Louisiana, we're 83% of total U.S. energy exports. So that's, that's significant as well, where a lot of the action happens. This is, you know, you can't talk about an energy transition, renewables and everything, unless you just mention the grid. And the reason I want to mention the Texas grid, so we have our own grid called ERCOT. And we have a very diverse mix. We, in fact, have one of the most diverse energy mixes of any state, even more so than California. Um, so this is just showing like a temperate day in December. And at that point, we were running like 50% solar and wind. So we were like 50% renewables, 
Natural gas was like a third, 10% coal, 10% nuclear. We don't really have any hydropower. Um, now, I, I was watching the grid when the solar eclipse happened because I was in the path. And I did this whole like chronicling of, of that event. And what happened was obviously solar power went down to almost zero, but natural gas shot up to 60%. And, and so that's the challenge that grids are coming into with renewables. And you know, we have, we have a lot of wind power. So California doesn't have the wind that we have. So if we didn't have wind, you know, we would have really been you know, in trouble. And so that just sort of right there highlights what this tension is with this um, low carbon transition. Uh, our grids, the constraints of the grids. And the other thing I want to note here regarding you know, what I was saying about modernization and innovation are pushing things. Because of technology, data centers, AI, quantum computing, machine learning, generative AI, all of it, very energy hungry. And because of this, um, we're so the United States power generation has been like flat for the last couple of decades, just like 1% growth from a large base. But it's supposed to grow 4% between now and 2030 because of the demands of tech. You know, because we have iPhones, because we're on the cloud, all of, all of those demands. And that is a huge increase and that energy has to come from somewhere which is going to be interesting. <laughs> um, and this is just showing, so in trying to answer these questions about what a transition looks like, where are we really, um, I, I sort of like, these are, this playlist, I have a YouTube channel, this playlist is called After the Fed. And I went to, over the last two years, three different Federal Reserve Bank conferences, and, and they have really excellent energy conferences. And so I went to Houston, like this was right when the IRA, low carbon investment legislation got passed. Um, and then I went to a tech disruption conference just a year ago at the Richmond Fed. And they had a foremost chips export, expert, a foremost AI, LLM, you know, generative AI expert. And then this was the very week that NVIDIA shot up from $300 you know, per share to $400 per share. So, so, the, so hence, I sort of took to the airwaves and did like an AI chips and energy. And now, you know, now that's being, that's coming to light more, you know, journalists are writing more articles about the challenges to do with all this tech and, and the energy that you're going to need um, to, to run all these data centers. Um, and so, so I roamed the country, I went to conferences, I listened to experts, you know, I did boots on the ground field work and um, wrote the story called Texas Million Dollar Miles, which is really indicative of the trends to do with the fossil fuel renewables dynamic and what the issues are. Because just in a, in a short nut, nutshell is that, so like our wind resources are in the panhandle, but it's like hundreds and hundreds of miles from demand centers. And we even established a, lot, a transmission system called CREZ, and this happened like 10 years ago that we built this. There's not gonna be another high transmission system built like this again because of not in my backyard issues. Um, people don't want transmission you know, built in their, in their, on their properties and things. So that's, that's one of the constraints with renewables is they're often far away from where the demand centers are. So that's another challenge that has to be overcome in time. Next, I just want to pivot over to, um, so this kind of gets into my resources work. Um, because of chronicling all the shale basins, you know, I started deciding, you know, well, where do I fit in this energy transition and this, this, these resource equations? And so the last couple of years, I've been focused on what's called natural capital. And basically, it's just how nature's assets are integrated into our lives, both economically and practically. And I've had two case studies um, from which I've worked on. And one of them is this, um, this right here is a large 80,000 acre ranch in the panhandle called the Turkey Track Ranch. It's this incredibly historic ranch. 
And I, I sort of weighed in about the natural capital assets of this ranch. And this was also a ranch that was a casualty of the fires we had in the Panhandle. 80% was burned. So we, you know, so there is climate change you know, right there in, in action. But um, what I wanted to say about this, though, is just that, you know, I was trying to find out, you know, going back to the fundamentals of energy and resources. Because, like I said, the fundamentals of economics and the location of where oil and gas is drives demand and supply, and as does economics. But there's also these equations with water resources, you know, um, energy resources. They all come together in, in land use, basically. And so this is just kind of highlighting what that, that work looks like. It's an advisory geared towards sustainably oriented projects and initiatives. Um, and it's what I call a natural capital approach, which means different things to different people. It's really become that idea and those words have become more in vogue um, you know, as, as you know, the green, green initiatives have, have evolved. It's also becoming financialized. Um, but I've sort of picked my place in this space where I, where I think it's practical and it serves um, you know, people and planet. Um, and like I said, Texas Energy and the Texas Triangle Growth, which I'm about to show you, um, has kind of been where my field of study has been, you know, looking at the physical in the natural world. So this is something that just came out, and this is kind of a model for the future sort of thing. Um, this is a feature that just came out in April in DCEO magazine, and again, this is on my site. And so what's really, really interesting about this is, um, a number of people really showed up at the right time. And that's something that runs through all the work I've done is it's the people, you know, it's leadership, it's people coming together, rolling up their sleeves and doing the right thing at the right time. And, and I've really seen that in all the leaders I've been, I've had access to in, in my career and in working on these stories. Um, but this one, it's, it's the same, very much so. And, um, so there's three people that showed up in this story. One is a caretaker and an engineer. One is an expert land and ranch broker. And then the second one was a visionary industrial real estate developer with mad logistics skills. So these are, see, so these are the people that come together to, in this story. So what it is is it's a development outside of Austin called Sandow Lakes Ranch. And it's a 33,000 acre development. And I learned about it in the winter of 2022 when I was interviewing for some, some other work. And, but I was really fascinated with it because I thought, you know, this really looks like you know, a really cool model of sustainability. And, and I wrote outlines about it, and I, just, and I finally just kind of forgot about it. Um, and then I was at a blockchain summit um, in, the fall, in the fall, just this fall. And I spent a lot of time on the Bitcoin mining stage because Bitcoin, you know, it's a huge energy user. And so I was really trying to see what was driving, you know, what they were doing and how they were finding, finding energy because there's a lot of Bitcoin mining that goes on in Texas. Um, and so I heard on two different, in, at two different times references to this development. And I was like, I know who owns this development. And so I, I talked to my editor and, and, the, and she's like, yeah, let's you know, go for it, you know, find out what's going on. And so in this development, what's really cool for me with my work, it's really with the natural world and a developer developing come together. It's water, it's energy resources, and, it's, and it also includes transportation infrastructure, like all these things coming together, and it's what's called a mega site. And where it is, um, is the Texas Triangle. And so this, is Dallas Fort Worth, and this is population density. San Antonio, Austin, Houston. The development's like right about here. And it's gonna get more relevant in a second when I show you something kind of interesting. Um, so what it was, what's unique about this development is that it was, in the 1950s, it was an aluminum smelter. And it, and it also had coal mining surrounding it. And so there was coal mining and coal fire power to support the smelter in the 50s. 
And it was like this economic engine of the, of the nearby counties. And they decided to shutter it in 2008. And so all the, all the local economies, everything declined around it. And, and then when Alcoa decided to you know, shut the plant, um, there had to be the remediation of the site. And the remediation was done by a gentleman that had been with the property since 1983. So he'd been there for 40 years. And he, he oversaw in every detail of the remediation. And it, in fact, won a Department of Interior award for the remediation efforts. So it's taking this old industrial asset, coal assets, you know, and turning it into something really green and, and very cool. Um, and so just to show you, this, this is a picture of the lakes. So it's called Sandow Lakes Ranch. And these used to be coal mining pits. And they were remediated. And now it's these beautiful lakes. And this is part of the industrial part. And when the developer first bought it, it looked like Chernobyl. You know, it was just like a, you know, just a wasteland of, of industry. And he's like um, using, reusing all of that, and it's going to be quite fantastic. But these, these are fans, and they're like 30 feet wide, and they used to be part of the cooling towers of the coal generation plant. And they're going to be fans used in like a creator's campus. So there's going to be um, all this really state-of-the-art um, advanced manufacturing campus as well as a creator's campus. There's going to be housing, solar, all sorts of things. Uh, and this is, a, this is nearby the development. And this is the Samsung chip plant. And it's been in the news a lot lately. So Tesla sided near Austin. Samsung is, is here near Austin as well. And they've spent $17 billion to develop this chip plant. And now it's going to cost like $30 billion. But recently, like within the last week and a half, Samsung announced that they're in fact going to spend $44 billion. That is a lot of economic activity you know, and innovation that's going to be happening right outside of Austin in that triangle region. So what's really interesting for myself is that you know, had I not had boots on the ground about all the energy developments and, and watching how that was moving and, and acting in our economy and what it afforded us, and then, and then segging it with this resources lens, you know, I would not have been able to recognize this, you know, this development for what it is. That it's something that's really a model for the future. So what it represents is this transformation in the industrial base. The very thing that the new priorities that we have set, you know, post-pandemic, that it, it is really coming into being. And but the gentleman that's developing this is like a complete visionary, you know. And so, and, and different people had to come along at the right time. And all these forces have happened, you know, with the pandemic and our shifting priorities where everything converged at the same time to make this kind of a really interesting, you know, case study. So basically forces converge, visions emerge. Um, it does reflect this old becoming new and these, these new trends in globalization. Um, like I said, the innovation campus is this convergence of chips and, sem and semiconductors, infrastructure, but in energy underpins all this. You know, you have to have the energy networks to make it happen. I think I so, sort of blew past my script. Let me just make sure I didn't miss something. Um, so yeah, so it's where energy and land come together. But again, it's people coming together at the right time, you know, human capital. And that was something that, that Bob was talking about. And I really see that in all my work. And the other thing to note, too, is that you know, this could not have happened in Texas where it did were it not for the shale revolution. So really, all of our energy production has afforded us an on-ramp to this reset and puts us in a really strong position, I think, globally, stronger than had we not had this shale revolution and we were reliant on OPEC and others. So I think that's a really um, underappreciated story. Um, so that is it. Um, we could just move to questions. Yes, Bob. <laughs> or, 
Okay, any questions? Yeah, the mic or just speak loudly. <laughs> <laughs> She's leaving. <laughs> when we were in the previous session, uh, I mentioned that the U.S. is really on the cusp of some truly game-changing type of economic activity that really revolves around the energy complex. So can you elaborate on that? Because, of course, you're talking about this. But what else do you see as how this then will translate into other parts of economic development? So how does our um, energy development translate into economic development? Yeah, and energy uh, revolution right. that we're seeing right now right. really translate into the economic activity that right. I was just kind of alluding to. Right. And are, are we prepared in terms of labor force, not just a labor force, but a trained labor mm -hmm. force? And then what are some of those obstacles? I think you've already mentioned several in terms of uh, you know what that may be. Yeah, well, I mean, I do think this development in the triangle does represent, you know, what having energy security, access to energy, access to affordable energy affords you. It affords you all these big global firms being wanting to set up where in, in your state, you know, for one. Um, now, Austin has universities nearby. It's known as a tech center, which I know Missoula is trying to, you know, become increasingly more of a, a hub as well. So those sorts of intentions, I think, do attract firms. You know, it starts attracting clusters of like-minded people. You know, the human capital once again. Um, now, something with energy that, you know, we can see this in Germany. You know, in Germany's energy costs went up 6x because they were not able to um, take in less expensive Russian pipeline gas. Uh, you know, industry did start leaving. You know, firms have started setting up in Mexico instead of, like VW decided they were going to put a plant in Mexico instead of Germany, you know, because of energy costs. So it does afford you, you know, this to be kind of a magnet for, for economic development. And I think that's a really good thing when we look at, you know, like some of China's priorities. And, and there is, um, you know, China has been a little bit hostile to, you, you know, foreign businesses, and a lot of foreign businesses are trying to redress that by moving their, shifting their supply chains around. So um, that's what I'd say. Anybody else? Energy question? <laughs> Geopolitics. <laughs> Part of his of Bob's question was um, the human capital to be able to right. to right. take on this this kind of uh, reinvention. Right. So right. What does that look like in our well, so there's a, a university called TCU, and it's in Fort Worth, and they have an energy institute, and I know the director really well, and and it's this woman, uh, dynamic woman, energy expert, and she goes around the country really talking about the human capital problems in energy <laughs> because um, you have a lot of the oil and gas industry that is, you know, 65 and older. Some of them are retiring. And then with all the green, you know, priorities before, a lot of, a lot of the Gen X and Ys didn't want to go into energy in hydrocarbons. And so you have a gap, you know. And now, so she goes around and talks about how we really need students to be interested in oil and gas because it's going to be around a really long time. Um, you know, so, so I think as people realize the reality of what's, in, what's demanded and what is real and, you know, the media what do you call it, just distorts, <laughs> distorts it and polarizes the issue a lot. And I think, and that is why I've done the work I've done, is just what is happening, what is real, what does this transition look like? Are we going from fossil fuels to renewables? No, it's a shift, it's a change. We're adding renewables, but we're just adding energy, you know, and we are going to have to, we are going to start using more nuclear in the future. 
because we need the density. Because that's the other thing that's been laid bare with renewables is they don't offer the type of energy density you need for this kind of activity. In fact, in Texas, we're having to add seven, we've, we're spending seven billion dollars to add more natural ga gas fired power. So there's base load. We have too many renewables that can't be hooked up. We can't use all the renewables we have, you know, and then there's more coming online. So those grid challenges are, are real, you know. They're happening in Texas, so we're kind of like this petri dish of what this transition really looks like, you know. Um, and so, yeah, the skills, you know, uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with what you're exposed to too, right? You know, who, who are your mentors? Who are your leaders? What are they saying? You know, are they, are they giving you the right information? Um, and, and, and maybe you have to make it attractive. You know, maybe you're going to have to incentivize, you know, this labor in the future. But I, I, think, I think the truth's starting to come out more and more that, you know, and, and if anything, I think the opportunity in hydrocarbons is that, you know, let's roll up our sleeves and learn how to produce them cleaner. And I think the industry is doing that. And some of that IRA legislation monies, some of it goes to renewables, but there's a lot that's being done to try to reduce emissions with hydrocarbon production. So, and, and they have huge capital budgets. So there's a lot of investment that can happen there too. So I think the innovation is in all these places, in all these spaces, and it's just a matter of what you're exposed to. And that's... I talk about this a lot, and I have a whole, I have a whole lot of videos um, talking about all this, this as well. You know, I've been chronicling and documenting all my research, and you know, because I've been around listening to the top experts in energy all over the country, and so I've sort of analyzed the analysis myself, you know, and, and conveyed it, you know, so that it's there. Um, That's another question: What is the trend countrywide? I mean, is this a central low? Um, yeah, is it representative? Is it well, okay, so now this, the reason I highlight this development is because it's so, it's unique, but it, it does reflect this idea of nearshoring. You know, this idea of bringing advanced manufacturing back to the United States. Um, it's happening in Arizona. They're building a chip plant. Idaho, they're trying to build a chip plant somewhere else in the Midwest as well that's happening and yeah there are shortages and I think that's been part of why there's been these cost overruns in this Samsung case um, they've had to bring over people that have the expertise from like Taiwan and you know in, in Singapore and you know different places to to start training but but there is a lot of money for training as well and I think that's why some of these um, these like advanced manufacturing places, the, semi, the semiconductor ecosystem that is being developed, there, there will be money for training. They're setting up training, you know, surrounding that. And I know that the, there's actually like a, new, a whole new university out in Austin that's going, going to happen because of these trends. You know, a private university, it's like, you can't, there hasn't been a private university in 100 years, you know, that set up shop in Austin. So, I mean, I think where, you know, where the demand is, you know, where the supply and demand is, it starts happening. And, and, and people in the United States, because we have a, a lot more fluid workforce, you know, people will move around to jobs, you know, whereas like in Europe, that's not the case. So we have a, a fairly mobile labor force, you know, to, a, as much as anybody, really. And so I think that bodes well for us as well. You know, so I, I, I'm optimistic, you know, I mean, and I think, like, for example, when Samsung announced that they're going to spend $44 billion now, and that was plastered all over the Wall Street Journal, it was, Bloomberg just did an article about it yesterday, they kind of, you know, Wall, um, Wall Street Journal had the exclusive, and then, and then I saw the Bloomberg one, you know, like 10 days later, and the only reason I noticed this was because I'd been to this development and I knew what was going on. I flew near the Samsung chip plant in a helicopter the day of my site visit, you know, so I saw it with my own eyes and it was like, oh my God, you know, it's almost like unless you see it, you can't believe it, and when it's just a story in a, in a newspaper or online, you're just, it's, you know, it's abstract, right? 
And so, um, so now I'm like a believer. I'm like, oh my God. But I see how our energy prowess has really been the magnet. If we didn't have the energy resources we have, they wouldn't have set up there. You have to have a lot of power for, the, for these things, you know, and you have to have water, water resources, you know. Well, that's been a, a topic of conversation in Montana with Bitcoin development. Yeah, yeah, we, six, I think, we're like, in Texas, we're one-sixth of the entire global Bitcoin mining sector is in Texas <laughs> because of our energy. But what they're doing is they're using, um, like for example, in West Texas, there was a decommissioned wind farm and a Bitcoin miner set up, started the wind farm back up and is using that. They, what they also do is now they're starting to work with oil and gas firms. And I learned this on all these Bitcoin mining stages I've been on. <laughs> there's, they, um, they'll set up on the edge of basins where there's like stranded gas and they'll, and they'll like, you know, use that stranded gas. That's, there's no pipelines going to it. So what they try to do, what they're also trying to do is like use wasted or stranded assets because they're going to have to because, you know, nobody wants to be competing with them on the grid, right? <laughs> you know, for your power, you know, do you, you want it for your home to cool it in the summer or do you want it for Bitcoin mining? You know, that's the, the tension now. But in Texas, because it's such a free energy market, um, something I, I talk about, I didn't mention it, but that there's all these centralized approaches to do with grids and, and low carbon energy and all the integration of various energy mix sources, but there's decentralized approaches a la the Bitcoin mining thing. But it's not just Bitcoin miners. It's also like NVIDIA. They, I know they've set up um, alongside, alongside some stranded assets somewhere. Or it might even be Wyoming. I can't remember where. But, um, and so there's all this you know, ex exploration happening, but that, that I think it, it offers innovation the one thing about the Bitcoin miners is they are, in fact, highlighting grid innovations <laughs> with some of the things, the tech, you know. So it's kind of like, you know, it's a double-edged sword, right? And, and how do you move forward, you know, pick your poison, <laughs> you know, but try not to do it poisonously, right? You have to, <laughs> you know, um, but it's, yeah, it's painful, <laughs> you know. Um. Other questions? Go ahead, please. If um, renewables aren't, as you say, energy dense enough to get, so what are the future? Yeah, so there are more renewables happening, absolutely going to happen, um, favored, liked, you know, you know policy driven, but they're just additional, right? They. They can replace some coal-fired power and some natural gas, but we have the intermittency problems, right? Like if the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, and we're nowhere near where one would think we might get to even with battery storage. You know, that's just like, it's, the economics of it are bad. And I have a, I have a video actually, this is a, one, if there's any video of my whole, um, I have a lot, it's called After the Fed. It's actually on my Twitter page, on my X page. It's pinned. It's called After the Fed, Hybrid Worlds, um, Circular Economy, Liquidity. And I have charts that absolutely show very simply and, and easily what the problems are with renewables, what the economics are, and, and all this stuff, and kind of like where things are at. Um, but what's going to happen probably if we continue on this track with all the needs of you know, advanced manufacturing, data centers, all that, there's going to have to be more nuclear you know, power. And, and that's China and India have more nuclear power generation on their books. Um, we're starting a little bit more with small scale nuclear modules. Um, there was actually in, I can't remember which bill, probably the, both the infrastructure bill that we passed post-pandemic and the low carbon bill, there's money for nuclear development. 
Um, so I, what's happened is, you know, let's just say it like this, just for simplicity purposes. Okay, we had a lot of nuclear power. We had Three Mile Island. Environmentalists didn't like it, right? Now they don't like fossil fuels, right? Those are both the two densest sources of power, <laughs> you know? So if you don't like nuclear or you don't like fossil fuels, well, what are you going to do, you know? burn dung, you know, um, and, so, and so it's not feasible to just move to a, a renewable world unless we somehow have some breakthrough where we can get solar power to be super dense, you know, so that's down the road and I suspect just from reading the tea leaves, we will have more nuclear and advances in, in fusion and fission before we maybe get to that solar breakout, you know. Um, so, so you have to have, you'll have to have nuclear, you know, power in some, in some form, natural gas as well. Um, but if you really want the bang for the buck over time, it's, it's probably gonna be nuclear and you want it clean, if you want it clean, <laughs> clean as well. Um, Yes, yes, we've done it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for staying after my job. It's a tough act to follow. <laughs>